What's up guys, if you're interested in getting sweet altars like these every month, you can do so by visiting our Patreon at patreon.com slash it resolves. What's up, guys, and welcome to another episode of the Crack a Pack series. Today, I am super, super excited to be opening up a pack of Conflux, a pretty awesome set, in my opinion. A lot of multicolored themes, a lot of really, really cool stuff. So, we'll hopefully get to open a lot of awesome stuff in this pack. Uh, real quick, also, I just want to let you guys know the giveaway for the Commander 2019 product is still going on. Uh, you will win, uh, whoever ends up winning will get their choice of any of the four decks that are being released this year. Uh, and the winner will be announced on the 26th. We'll do that through video as well as uh, on social media and stuff. So we've had a couple people asking. I just wanted to go ahead and, and make that point right now. Uh, also, really quick, thank you to everybody who has been uh, joining that giveaway. I think this is by far our, our largest giveaway yet. Uh, we've had so, so many people uh, enter this one. We really, really appreciate it. We're in the multiples of hundreds at this point, which is insane to us. Uh, but thank you so much, guys. Seriously, we really, really appreciate the support. A lot of you guys have been leaving really positive comments back, which we, of course, appreciate. So uh, without further ado, we will go ahead and open up this pack. Uh, we're going to do this as if it's a pack one, pick one scenario. So hopefully uh, we will be able to figure out what our pack one, pick one would actually be if we were drafting the set. I did not draft this uh, at the time or anything like that. I don't think I've ever drafted it. Uh, but hopefully I can give some at least educated opinion on this. So as such, we'll go through every card. Our first one here is Frontline Sage. Uh, it's a 0-1 for 2 and a blue. Doesn't sound great at first, but it does have Exalted. So whenever a creature you control attacks alone, that creature gets plus 1, plus 1 until the end of the turn. This was a pretty great mechanic. We see it uh, now a lot on things like Noble Hierarch, uh, which makes it just that much better as a Mana Dork. But uh, a really, really powerful ability for sure. Uh, and then with this, you can pay a blue, tap it, draw a card, and then discard a card. So this is actually an active looter. What I like about this is it's not damage focused. Uh, a lot of times we'll see, uh, not with Merfolk looter, but with like Scroll Thief and stuff like that, you can uh, get a little bit of looting or drawing uh, off of dealing damage to an opponent, which is fine, but... Obviously, that makes it pretty difficult if they're just outpowered, which they tend to be. So I like that this is an activated ability. I like that it has just a general buff for your team. Uh, if you've got a creature that's doing the most and swinging in and dealing damage, give it a little bit of an extra boost. I like it a lot for that. Uh, so I'm actually not, uh, I, I don't hate this card. I don't think this is bad. I don't know if it's first pickable by any means, but I do like it so far. I think it's a decent start. <laughs> Uh, Avon Squire uh, is a 1-1 for 1 and a white. It has flying and exalted as well. So again, uh, buffs up a creature if it's swinging in alone. Uh, this is a perfectly fine 2-drop. Uh, I think it's a 1-1 flyer for 2. Not amazing, obviously, but it is a flyer, so it's evasive. Uh, and not only that, but if it's attacking in alone, or if even another creature of yours is attacking in alone, uh, it's going to get that buff, and that buff is actually useful. That that does set damage a little bit harder to kind of deal around with your opponent. I think that's really, really important to keep in mind, uh, and so I like it for that. Uh, personally, I like the Frontline Sage a little bit better, just because I value that looting ability pretty highly. Uh, but this is much more of an aggressive card, there's no doubt about it. And honestly, over the two, this is probably the better of the two cards, but I don't really expect to be picking either one first pick. Uh, so we'll see what we get for the rest of the pack. Uh, Wretched Banquet. Uh, it's a sorcery for one black. Destroy target creature if it has the least power or is tied for the least power among creatures in play. Uh, I don't love this. Uh, conditional removal is sometimes very, very good. Uh, but in this case, you might have the creature with the least power on the field, in which case this is a very dead card. Obviously, that's bad. Uh, there are instances, of course, where it still will be of actually a really, really good removal spell. But in general, I feel like it's probably not the best. Um, it is very efficient, uh, which I do really, really like. It's at sorcery speed, not amazing, but for only one black mana, uh, destroying a creature is fantastic. I mean, that's great value. It just, it might happen to be your own creature. There are instances where this just is very, very bad. So, uh, I don't like this card very much. Generally, I value removal pretty heavily and would pick it over the two cards we have so far. But in this case, that conditional side of it is a little bit tricky. So I would probably not pick this. <laughs> Uh, Sylvan Bounty is an instant for five and one green. 
Uh, target player gains eight life, and then you can basic land cycle this. So what's really, really cool is with cycling and basic land cycling, uh, it means cards that are generally not quite as playable, like sometimes we'll, you'll see it on like a disenchant effect or a destroy target like shatter effect or something like that. Uh, but you can also then cycle the card. That makes that card playable main deck uh, because even if the opponent doesn't have an enchantment, doesn't have an artifact, something like that, you can still cycle it away and still get some benefit out of it. And it's really, really good for that. Uh, it just lets you add in that tech main board so you're not you know, losing out game one to something kind of jank or something like that. So I like it for that reason. But in this case, eight life, not amazing. Uh, but basic land cycling, if you don't know, you can pay one in a green in this case. Discard this card and then search your library for a land card, reveal it, and then put it into your, into your hand. You then shuffle your library afterwards. It's cool because this in general actually fixes you, which is really, really nice. A uh, lot of really important stuff. It might... For my understanding, there was a lot of multicolored stuff, if I remember correctly. I might be uh, confusing it with something like Shards of Alara. Uh, very possible. But uh, there was some multicolored stuff, if I'm not mistaken, and being able to cycle uh, for basic lands and actually pull out the, the fixing that you need is really, really good. Uh, and so in that instance, I like it a lot. Uh, but that 8 life is just useless. <laughs> uh, not completely, obviously, but... In general, it's just not worth it. This is not one of those effects that's really going to save you or win you the game. Uh, and so it's not really worth playing, in my opinion, unless you just absolutely need the fixing. Uh, in which case, run it just for the fixing. It's perfectly fine for that. Uh, Canyon Minotaur is a 3-3 vanilla creature for 3 and a red, and this is a very not great card in this set, in my opinion. Uh, usually in a general expansion like a core set, stuff like this is okay. Uh, it's not amazing, but it's a curve pick. You really, really consider your curve pretty heavily there, and you should always consider your curve, even in you know any set that you're drafting. Very, very important, of course, but uh, a 3-3 three, three for 4 is very underpowered uh, in your normal expansions at this point. And so it's really just not great. There are, I'm sure, instances where it'll be fine, but it's not good. It's not going to win you the game by any means. Uh, and it just doesn't do anything as it impacts the board or anything like that. It's just a 3-3 three, three for 4, which generally speaking means it's probably going to be a little outpowered uh, at the point in which you can play this. And so not super exciting. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, traumatic Visions as an instant for three and two blue counter target spell. And then again, we see that basic land cycling for one and a blue in this case, instead of one and a green. Uh, obviously a pretty expensive counter, but again, it has that added uh, land cycling ability that just makes it that much better uh, and more flexible. And flexibility is really, really key, especially in limited. Uh, and so I don't mind this as much as I normally would. Now, a five mana counter, pretty bad, but uh, there are instances late in the game where you might have to leave up that five mana for this, and you can really, really get some good uh, value, excuse me, off of a card like this. If you can counter their bomb uh, for only five mana or something like that, you can really put yourself in a winning position. Uh, you can also then just cycle it away if you get it early and it's just kind of a dead card in your hand, or you need that fixing, of course. So I actually don't mind this. I don't think it's as good as the Frontline Sage. There's a lot of card advantage that comes out of that, as well as that Exalted Trigger. Uh, and so I think that's a little bit better, but not as bad as maybe you would think it would be uh, for a five mana counter, solely because of that basic land cycling. <coughs> uh, Wandering Goblins uh, is a 0 3 for 2 and a red. It has domain, so you can pay 3 and it gets plus 1 plus 0 until the end of the turn for each basic land type among lands you control. Again, we're seeing that multicolor uh, kind of facet of this set come out. We haven't actually seen any gold cards yet, and I might be very wrong about all this multicolor stuff, but that basic land cycling is a pretty good indication if you've never uh, played with a set like this that it's probably a good idea to have some multicolor stuff. And this is a bit of a payoff for that. Having some multicolor, like different lands uh, among your basic land types just means that this is going to get a much bigger buff uh, than it normally would. And that's perfectly fine. Um, I don't really think it's an amazing card uh, because really I wouldn't imagine going more than like three colors most of the time, maybe four. You could probably splash for four. Uh, but a four, three max for three that you have to pay three to actually make a four three seems kind of bad in my opinion it just seems like a lot of investment for not a huge payoff uh and so in my opinion this card's a little bit bad not super exciting but it does feature that domain mechanic pretty well uh brackwater elemental 
uh, is a 4-4 four, four for 2 and a blue. Uh, attacks, when it attacks or blocks, sacrifice it at the end of the turn. And then this features Unearth, which is actually a really cool mechanic. I love this one. So for 2 and a blue, uh, you can return this card from your graveyard to play. It gains haste. And then you remove it from the game at the end of the turn. Uh, or excuse me, if it would leave play. Uh, and so uh, either one of those, by the way, if it hits the end of the turn or it would be removed from play, it, it's at, or, uh, removed from the field. Excuse me. I'm saying things incorrectly, but you get my point. It basically is like a reanimation spell tied to the creature itself. It's just only for one turn. This is a very aggressive blue card uh, in terms of being a three mana four four. Obviously, it's kind of like a, a ball lightning effect or something like that, where uh, it swings in once and then it just has to be sacrificed at the end of the turn. That doesn't feel amazing in blue, in my opinion. Uh, blue tends to be much more of a like longevity play. Uh, you, you bury your opponent in card advantage. You get that incremental advantage over t multiple turns, not just slam in for a bunch of damage. Uh, and four damage, honestly, is not a ton. I think if you draw this in the late game, it's probably just going to be outpowered, in which case it really doesn't do much. Uh, and so I'm not a huge fan of a card like this uh, in blue in particular. If I was in red, I think I'd be a little bit more open to it just because it's much more of an aggressive uh, color. And so something like this could actually solidify your, your winning position, which would be great. But in blue, not super excited by this. I still like that frontline sage a little bit more. Uh, but again, we'll see what happens. Finally, a gold card. I don't feel as bad now. Uh, suicidal Charge. Uh, it's an enchantment for three, a black and a red. Uh, you sacrifice Suicidal Charge and creatures your opponents uh, control get minus one, minus one until the end of the turn. And then those creatures attack this turn if able. So you can kind of force your opponent into an, an attack that may not be very uh, advantageous for them. Uh, and then also kind of degrade their team a little bit with that minus one, minus one. I think it's a bit of a long play. Uh, I feel like this would be a much more better, a much better constructed card than a, uh, a limited card. I might be wrong in saying that, to be honest. I feel like it's really powerful to be able to make your opponent swing in, but you have to be reliant on the fact that you have creatures to block with, and that's where I'm a little bit hazy on this. Uh, cards that rely on other cards, generally speaking, are a little bit of a, a lower tier in my mind of a pick, just because you can't guarantee. You, you don't have the option of like a constructed deck where you're... You, you can reasonably assume that you'll have a certain creature out at a certain period of time or a certain card out at a certain period of time. In this case, you have much less control over that, and so you don't necessarily know what the board state's going to be like, and this might not be a very good time to use this card. Now, of course, it is an enchantment. You can use it at any point, which is nice. You can, you can throw it out there. You don't have to use it right away. But then your opponents know it's coming. It's a little bit, it's, it kind of loses the element of surprise, which I don't like either. So I think this is much more of a constructed card. I could be wrong on that. Uh, and feel free, if you drafted during this time, please let me know, because I, I would be very interested to know if this is a really powerful card and I'm just mis, mis, uh, misinterpreting it. But in my opinion, it, it's not great. Uh, Maniacal Rage is an enchant creature for one and a red. Uh, the enchanted creature gets plus two, plus two, and cannot block very very red uh, aggressive card uh can be very very powerful as well if you get it in the early turns and you can really start swinging in for a lot of damage obviously the creature can't block so you might as well just keep swinging in with it uh really really cool it does open yourself up to the classic two for one with enchant creatures i'm not a huge fan of that but uh some people love to play that way and i don't think there's anything wrong with it it's just you have to be willing to, to sacrifice two cards for maybe one removal spell uh if you're interested in doing that so it doesn't feel great to me. It's not a first pick, definitely, but if I was in a red aggressive deck, I'd consider it for sure. Uh, it's not a bad card. That buff can be really, really good in the early turns and really actually sure up the game pretty quickly if you get enough uh, swings in with it. So very good in that regard. Uh, our first uncommon here is Filigree Fracture. Uh, it's an instant for two and a green. Destroy target artifact or enchantment. If that permanent was blue or black, you draw a card. Um... This is very much a sideboard card, obviously. Uh, any kind of artifact or enchantment hate tends to be uh, much more uh, r regulated to the sideboard. Now, that's not always the case. It depends on the, the set that you're in. But in this case, I would say definitely, definitely sideboard. Uh, what's nice is this is good regardless of the color of deck you're up against, but it has the added upside against blue or black, which I like. It's definitely nice to not have it target only blue or black permanents or something along those lines, uh, because then it's much more focused. It's much more obviously a sideboard card at that point, uh, but less less of an option against a lot of different decks. This is still good regardless of the deck you're up against. It just has some added upside, obviously, if you're against blue or black. 
Not a first pick by any means either, uh, but if you're in green and you need some artifact or enchantment hate uh, for your sideboard, this is a perfect card to pick up. Uh, Paragon of the of the Amesha, 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 uh, Amesha. I'm gonna say it's Amesha. Uh, it's a two-two for two and a white. It has first strike, which is very, very good. Uh, and then you can pay Wooberg one of each color, and until the end of the turn, it becomes an angel and gets plus three, plus three, and flying and lifelink. That is a lot uh, on one singular creature. Now let's break this down a little bit. A two-two for three with first strike. Not terrible. It's pretty good. Uh, being able to win in combat against creatures that are the exact same stats is pretty awesome. Uh, that just means it's going to survive a lot longer. It's going to deal with a lot of creatures a lot better. Uh, it can even trade up if the opposing creature, no matter what the power of the opposing creature, if that only has two toughness, this is going to win that combat, and that's fantastic. Wooberg, a little bit difficult to pull off, but as we've seen throughout this entire pack, we've seen a lot of basic land cycling and a lot of things like Domain that are hinting to us that it's really, really nice to be able to spread out your colors and maybe splash for a lot of things because there's payoffs for it. This is the exact kind of payoff you were looking for. Now, it's good on its own, but with that Wooberg ability, this is a fantastic card. If you can get all your colors out, you can really, really start dealing a lot of damage. Keep in mind, it keeps first strike. So it's first strike, flying, lifelink, 5-5, five, five, angel. That's amazing. That's a lot of stuff on one card. Obviously, you have to pay Wooberg to do that, but you can do it on any player's turn you can do it as a defense mechanism you can do it as an offense mechanism a lot of flexibility with this uh, it's very difficult to get all five colors but with all this basic land cycling and things like that i would lean towards picking this so far just because it has such a huge payoff and even without that payoff it's still a pretty solid three drop uh, so so far i think this is the pick uh, Spore Burst is a sorcery for three and a green. It does have domain as well, so you put a 1-1 green sapperling creature token into play for each basic land type among lands you control. Again, we're seeing that payoff of going into multiple colors, and this is a huge one. Being able to really, really just throw out up to five 1-1 uh, one -one sapperlings is great. That's a lot of power uh, for only four mana. I would still go for the Paragon. It seems a little bit better to me. Uh, and the, I, I would consider picking this pretty early on, though. I do think that this is a powerful card. A lot of spread out damage over multiple different creatures is usually pretty powerful and limited because it opens your, yourself up. You can always double block, triple block, do whatever, but you can also start swinging in with multiple different creatures and make it really difficult for your opponent to block uh, effectively. So I like it for that reason. I'd still go the Peregrine, but uh, definitely a powerful card. Uh, our token, our land... And then our rare here is Knight of the Reliquary. So this is a pretty awesome card. Uh, it's a 2-2 for one, a green, and a white. And it gets plus one, plus one for each land card in your graveyard. Uh, and then you can tap it, sacrifice a forester plane, search your library for a land card, put it into play, and then shuffle your library. So what's really cool about this is it fuels itself. Uh, it takes a little while. That's kind of the downside to it. But uh, it does fuel itself. It's really, really nice at doing that. You can sacrifice forest, go get another uh, aura plane, excuse me, and then find any land that you want. And any land that you want is really good for cards like the Paragon. Uh, you can pull out whatever basic land you need. So there's a little bit of synergy there, uh, especially with the domain mechanic. Maybe the Paragon or the Spore Burst probably won't wield, but it would be really, really great to get a card like that after picking the Knight. Uh, and so in my mind, I think the knight is the pick. I think it's just the most uh, correct pick. It's a bit of an enabler, and it's also just a powerful card on its own. It can really fuel itself into a huge creature, which I like. So I think that's it. Uh, oh, also, it does thin out your deck, which is worth noting. I should mention that. Um, not, to, not to harp on it too much, but thinning out your deck is really, really, really good uh, in limited because it just means you're not going to get flooded as much. Uh, which means hopefully you're going to be drawing effective spells. So in my mind, Knight of the Reliquary, Reliquary excuse me, is definitely the pick. Also a really fun pull. I love this card. Uh, really, really great Maverick and things like that. So cool to see this. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this pack opening video. If you did, please make sure to leave a like or a comment down below. And as always, please make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome content. But with that, I'm going to get out of here. Thanks so much for watching, guys. I'll see you in the next Crack-A-Pack episode.